Hey folks, I'm Demotro, and on this side of me I have all of the two-digit numbers that are prime numbers, whereas on this side I have all of the two-digit numbers that aren't, the ones known as composite numbers. Now, prime numbers are an important mystery within mathematics, and their patterns can be hard for a human or even computer to spot. But in this size range, when we're just looking at two digit or even three digit numbers, there are some surprisingly easy tricks. So today I wanna show you some of those shortcuts that'll show us a bit about the structure of numbers and let us quickly determine whether a number should be on this list without having to memorize a list like this. As a quick reminder of what these terms mean, every positive whole number, which is the type of number we'll be describing in this episode, is either the number one or has other factors or numbers that can divide it without a remainder. And if a number has factors bigger than one but smaller than itself, that can divide it, or in other words, if a number can be the area of a rectangle with side lengths that are whole numbers bigger than one but smaller than the number itself, that number is known as a composite number, whereas if a number cannot form any rectangle of that sort without a remainder and can only be divided by one or itself, that number is known as a prime number. Like here I have 27 dice. We could have even visualized 27 as a three by three by three shape because it is three times three times three. But we're gonna look at it in a flat sense today because that puts all of the factors into pairs. Here we can see that whether I have this rectangle oriented that way or oriented that way, it's describing that three and nine are paired together to multiply to 27. But what if we had a number that turned out to not have any of the first few factors I checked? How many factors or rectangles would I have to check before knowing that number had to be a prime? Now, starting with the one-digit numbers, many of you may already know that the one-digit primes are two, three, five, or seven. But what if you only knew that one was neither prime nor composite, two was prime, and this one useful fun fact, which is that nine is the smallest odd composite number. After two, we have prime, even, prime, even, prime, even, and then nine the smallest odd composite. Now that fact about nine didn't just tell us about the number nine, but also about all the smaller whole numbers. So to expand the range of whole numbers that we know information about, let's bring out another fun fact. 25 is the smallest odd and throd composite number. By throd, I mean not threeven, or in other words, not divisible by three, similar to how odd means not divisible by two. So in other words, 25 is the smallest composite number that doesn't contain a factor of two or three. That tells us that all of the numbers smaller than 25 and bigger than 3 are either even and or threeven. With 24 here, it's both. We can make it into an even amount, or I could have made it a 3 by something. Or the number, like 23 here, will be prime. Meaning that if I wondered if 23 was prime, I would just have to check in my head, can it divide two without a remainder? Nope. Can it divide three without a remainder? Also nope. Therefore, since it's smaller than 25 and doesn't have a factor of two or three, it must be prime. 
Now, testing if a number is even is incredibly easy in our base 10 way of writing numbers. Anything ending in an even digit, 0, 2, 4, 6, or 8, must be on this side of the list, except for the number 2 itself. Multiples of 5 also have an easy test, due to 5 being the other factor in our base 10 system, where nothing bigger than 5 is a prime if it ends in a 0 or 5, the last digits that are multiples of 5. Threven numbers actually have a test that's almost as simple as that, where in our base 10 system, 3 is a factor of the number 1 less than 10, which gives them this digit-adding superpower, where if and only if a number's digits add to a multiple of 3, the number will be a multiple of 3. And we can see that none of these have the digits add to a 3, 6, 9, 12, or etc. And so by looking at the last digit and doing a quick digit addition test, we can easily test if any number has a factor of 2, 3, and or 5 or not. So how far does that get us in the range of numbers that we know about? Well, after 5, it turns out that the smallest number that is neither even, threeven, nor a multiple of 5 yet is composite will be 7 squared, the square of the next prime, because multiples of 6 are already covered by our 2 and 3 tests. So any whole number bigger than 5 but smaller than 7 squared must either be prime or have a factor of 2, 3, and or 5 somewhere within it. Now, to get a slightly more algebraic look at this, we can imagine a number as having factors of 1 and itself, and if the number isn't prime, it'll have more factors additionally within this range. And the most limited amount of factors it could have would be in one of those cases that were in our fun facts, 9, 25, 7 squared, which is 49. Those are squares of primes, and their only factor apart from one and themselves will be their square root, which will be a whole number and be the prime they're the square of. And we noted that all of the factors come in pairs. In the case of a square number, one of them is paired up with itself, which is why we ended up with an odd number of factors. And in fact, if and only if you're a square number, you have an odd number of factors. Any factors that are in addition to this or instead of this will come in pairs. Now, if I ever have a pair of numbers, like 2 and 10 in this case, that multiply to some given composite number, unless they were both the square root of that number, one thing in the pair must have been smaller than the square root, and one must be bigger. If both of them were smaller than the square root, they would have to multiply to smaller than the number. And if both of them were bigger, they would have to multiply to bigger than the number. For example, if I wondered if 21 is prime, it's not a square number. So this won't be a whole number factor, but the square root is somewhere in between 4 and 5 because it's bigger than 4 squared and smaller than 5 squared. That means that any factors this number has can be put in pairs where 1 is 4 or less and 1 is 5 or more. In the case of 21, we have 1 and itself as a pair, as well as the pair 3 and 7. And if we wondered if this was prime, first we'd think, is the last digit even or a multiple of 5? No. So let's run the Threven test. Do the digits add to a multiple of 3? Yes. It must be divisible by 3. But if I had the number 23 here instead, and I ran the even test and it failed that, and I ran the threeven test and it failed that, because this is smaller than the next square of a prime, 25, it must be prime itself. 
So to clarify what that tells us so far, if we know that two is a prime, we can know that any number larger than two, but smaller than three squared must either be even or prime. And if we then know that three is prime, we can know that any number larger than three, but smaller than the next prime squared will be either even and or three even or prime. And then by using the multiple of five test as well, that confirms every number up through 48, right under seven squared. So if we need to know if a number under 50 is prime, and we know that 49 is a square number and thus not prime, all we have to do is run the even test and multiple of five test, which are just based on the last digit, and do that quick three even test as well. But I said that we could do a bigger range and that it wouldn't be that hard to do all of the two digit numbers. That's because every two digit number is smaller than the next prime squared. 11 squared is 121. And that means that any number bigger than seven, but smaller than 121, must either be prime or have some prime factor, two, three, five, or seven inside it. In other words, every number between eight and 120 is either prime or has a one digit prime factor. Now, in our base 10 way of writing numbers, there's not as easy of a divisibility test for seven as for those other small primes. If we counted in base six instead, it would be easier. Now, a test we could use for sevens in base 10 is you double the last digit and find the difference between that and the rest of the number and see if that's a multiple of seven or not. But if we introduce that test, we're gonna have to run it on a bunch of smaller numbers too to confirm that they're on the primes list. If we just care about primes in this range up through 99, then it ends up being easier looking at just a few multiples of seven that would sneak past our two, three, and five tests because most of the multiples of seven are also even, three, even, or a multiple of five. And only a few numbers in this range would sneak by those tests but not be prime. Those numbers would be seven times another prime that's at least seven. Otherwise, it would already have been covered by the two, three, or five test. And seven times seven, the first one there, is 49. Hopefully many of you already recognize that as a square number and know that square numbers can't be primes. And the next one, seven times 11, is also pretty easy to spot. 77 isn't a prime. And then we get one sneaky two digit number. In my opinion, the easiest two digit number to mix up whether it's a prime or not. Seven times 13, which is 91 and not a prime. Now, we could apply that seven test, doubling the last digit has a difference of seven from the rest of the number, which makes it divisible by seven. But if we don't wanna run that seven test on all of these numbers, we can remember that any number below 90, we can just run the two, three, and five test on, or check if it happens to be seven squared or seven times 11. And if we want to expand our range a little, we do need to recognize 91, which one way of identifying is to note that it's 21 more than 70. And we know that 70 and 21 are multiples of seven themselves. If you wanted to go up to 120, then we would need to include just one more multiple of seven. Seven times 17 is also in that range if we're going all the way up to 120. 
Seven times 17 is 119. And those would be the only numbers less than 11 squared that would not register on our two, three, or five test, but that we wouldn't want on our primes list. Overall, these are types of lists that wouldn't be worth memorizing and taking up that much brain space just to memorize them as digits. But if you know a few simple tricks for... Oh! Uh, Carlo, uh, water. If you know some simple tricks, it's pretty quick to calculate them. Hope you enjoyed learning about some primes with me today. Thanks for coming to combo class, and I'll see you in the next one.